Hello, good morning and welcome to St Michael's uh, Moyne for morning prayer on Thursday the 6th of September. It's a commemoration of Alan Gardner. So you might like to look up in the Red Book if you're following there. Morning and evening prayer during ordinary time, morning prayer on Thursday. And also today's date, 6th of September, two thirds of the way in, in the sanctuary, the list of uh, people who can remember day by day during the year. All of those commemorations and festivals at least. Thursday the 6th of September, Alan Gardner, A-L-L-E-N, and you'll find directions there for some optional extras that we may be using as we go through the service this morning. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. A song of God's blessing. God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations rejoice and be glad, for you will judge the peoples righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then shall the earth bring forth her increase, and God, our own God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. So we're following the Red Book, we turn to the back, and hopefully this will be the last of these switching to and fro. Keep your finger in the Thursday morning prayer page, because we'll be going back there after the Psalms. And right at the very back, we'll find the Psalter. And the appointed psalmody this morning are three, numbers 14, 15 and 16. 14, 15 and 16. We say the refrains at the beginning and end. We say the glory be before we repeat the refrain a second time in each psalm. And each psalm has a short prayer following, which if you have it, you may like to use it in silence. So the three psalms, 14, 15 and 16. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and abominable in their wickedness. There is no one that does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the children of earth to see if there is anyone who is wise and seeks after God. But every one has turned back. All alike have become corrupt. There is none that does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, those evildoers, who eat up my people as if they ate bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There shall they be in great fear, for God is in the company of the righteous. Though they would confound the counsel of the poor, yet the Lord shall be their refuge. O oh, that Israel's salvation would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, then will Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom.
Through the greatness of your mercy I will come into your house. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may rest upon your holy hill, whoever leads an uncorrupt life and does the thing that is right, who speaks the truth from the heart and bears no deceit on the tongue, who does no evil to a friend and pours no scorn on a neighbour, in whose sight the wicked are not esteemed, but who honours those who fear the Lord, whoever has sworn to a neighbour and never goes back on that word, who does not lend money in hope of gain, nor takes a bribe against the innocent, whoever does these things shall never fall. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Through the greatness of your mercy, I will come into your house. <clears throat> the Lord is at my right hand, I shall not fall. Preserve me, O God, for in you have I taken refuge. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, all my good depends on you. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble in heart. Though the idols are legion that many run after, their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, neither make mention of their names upon my lips. The Lord himself is my portion and my cup. In your hands alone is my fortune. My share has fallen in a fair land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel, and in the night watches he instructs my heart. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand, I shall not fall. Wherefore my heart is glad and my spirit rejoices. My flesh also shall rest secure. For you will not abandon my soul to death, nor suffer your faithful one to see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. And in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. <clears throat> and so we turn to the Song of the Covenant back in morning prayer on Thursday. I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you in righteousness. Thus says God, who created the heavens, who fashioned the earth and all that dwells in it, who gives breath to the people upon it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord, and I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the captives from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you in righteousness. Alan Francis Gardner was born in 1794 and joined the Royal Navy as a young man. He resigned in 1826 and on the death of his wife in 1834 dedicated himself to missionary work. He pioneered a mission to the Zulus in South Africa for the Church Missionary Society <coughs> and founded the city of Durban. He then went to South America to investigate the possibility of evangelism amongst the indigenous tribes. He travelled extensively and founded the South American Mission Society in 1844 with seven other missionaries. He died of starvation in the year 1851 on the shores of Tierra del Fuego. <clears throat> so to our first Bible reading, 1 Kings chapter 4, chapter 4 of 1 Kings from 29 to the twelfth verse in the following chapter. 1 Kings 4, 29. God gave Solomon very great wisdom, discernment and breadth of understanding as vast as the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. 
He was wiser than anyone else, wiser than Ethan the Ezrathite, and Heman, Calcol, and Dada, children of Mahal. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He would speak of trees, from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows in the wall. He would speak of animals and birds and reptiles and fish. People came from all the nations to hear the wisdom of Solomon. They came from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Now King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to my father David, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. Therefore command that cedars from the Lebanon be cut before me. My servants will join your servants, and I will give you whatever wages you set for your servants, for you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. When Hiram heard the words of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord today, who has given to David a wise son to be over this great people. Hiram sent word to Solomon, I have heard the message that you have sent to me. I will fulfill all your needs in the matter of cedar and cypress timber. My servants shall bring it down to the sea from the Lebanon. I will make it into rafts to go by sea to the place you indicate. I will have them broken up there for you to take away, and you shall meet my needs by providing food for my household. So Hiram supplied Solomon's every need for timber of cedar and cypress. Solomon in turn gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of fine oil. Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year, so the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him. There was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. <coughs> So it looks like Solomon's monarchy is going from strength to strength. Yesterday it opened with us being told that he made a marriage alliance with Egypt. And then we were told how he'd met God whilst worshipping um, in Gibeah, I think, on one of the high places, noting that the temple hadn't been built yet and there wasn't a single um, cult of worship around the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> and whilst he was worshipping there, he had his conversation with God about uh, what God wanted doing sort of a, a genie in the lamp, what would you like? And uh, Solomon asked for wisdom and therefore God gave him everything else as well. But then we had the example of his wisdom. The two women uh, described as prostitutes in our translation, each having a child, one died by being rolled on in the night. So the one woman stole the other child and he asked the child to be cut in half and half given to each as a way of discerning because the actual mother wanted the child to survive and so then we've move on, moved on from that to today the next reading in relation to Solomon's life <clears throat> and uh, we just have a sort of a, a conclusion or a summary of his wisdom to open saying he was wiser than these people we've never heard of but presumably they were wise people in those days uh, I suspect they were they're not described as prophets, but they might have been prophets from other faiths, but they're likely to have been educated people who were known to the writers of this text, <clears throat> maybe as um, civil servants, if you like, who've been taken from other places by oppressors and uh, their decisions made by, the decisions they made uh, may have been promulgated through texts sent out among, among the regions and whatnot and their fame might have spread in that way but we don't know who they are now oh, well I don't certainly and uh, I'm intrigued that we're told that his wisdom goes beyond simply judicial decisions but also he knew about wildlife I think that's very interesting <coughs> that uh, I remember doing a when I was doing my environmental degree my first degree <coughs> we had a seminar and some people had been asked to see what the religion said about environment and stewardship and uh, they came back saying that uh, there was nothing very much and here's a lovely little passage that Solomon is great man he was famed for his wisdom and his temple building being a son of David and the father of Jesus great 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 grandfather of Jesus um, the example of his knowledge his learning that is given isn't numbers isn't the stars isn't philosophy but it's uh, the study of biology or ecology, however you want to put it. 
At any rate, we then have um, two paragraphs that describe the next feature of his alliances. I think I've said before, the northern tribes were um, seafaring, so they were able to trade with um, the Israelites, the Judeans, uh, with the stuff that was brought by sea, exotic things and timber and whatnot. And uh, the people of Israel, when um, things were favourable between them and their God, their God would send rains and uh, they were able to sell, because most people were nomadic in that part of the world, they were able to sell their grain, their oil, their wine. <clears throat> and so here you have an example of that with the king of Tyre saying hello to Solomon and uh, Solomon saying, can you send some timber? Him agreeing as long as you send food. So they've engaged in this um, excellent bilateral trade agreement. May God give our um, politicians wisdom as we try and negotiate uh, as few strings as we can with uh, our European neighbours, but uh, as good a, a deal as we can get, facing up to the almost certainty, I would suggest, of not having a deal. But then I guess you have to start from square one and trying to get back in with one as soon as possible. Or at least not get our political representatives back into the heart of the decision-making process, which is where they are at the moment. But at least get our negotiators knocking on the door. Enough. So to Acts 15 from verse 1, the second reading, Acts 15 from 1. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss the question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, and that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence. And listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the, among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favourably on the Gentiles to take from among, from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen from its ruins. I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication or from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for, generation, for generations past, Moses has had those to procl who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. So, the gospel has been going out, persecuted believers on Jesus from a Jewish background have been dispersed and as they've gone they've spoken the word and they've uh, stayed in larger places and gone off on shorter little journeys and come back and there's been communication between Jerusalem which is sort of the core where the apostles are still based and these little outreach projects, a significant outreach project. Um, but then our reading today opens with us being told that there were some ex, well, some believers who were of the view that people need to be circumcised. And this was a question that would have developed as Jews and Gentiles started to form believing groups that believed on Jesus. Some were and some weren't. And so it was obviously a question that needed to be addressed. 
<coughs> so there's a great debate and there's obviously not an easy answer because Paul and Barnabas aren't able to persuade those and so they go back to have a church council meeting on whether circumcision is in, uh, critical for Christians or those that believe on Jesus. And uh, as they went, they encouraged people in Phoenicia and Samaria. So I guess that's kind of Greece, is it? And uh, Samaria, these regions as they pass through. And they come to Jerusalem, they work by the churches also, I guess, noting that they were travelling by boat and on foot and on horseback or whatever. So it was uh, quite a journey. So it was quite a significant issue. And it wasn't going to go away. <coughs> but they were welcomed. <clears throat> as was all that they reported God had done with them. But interestingly, we're told that believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees said that it is necessary for the law of Moses to be kept. Um, necessary to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. So that's interesting that we've got ex-Pharisee believers and they're still, if you like, up to their old tricks of trying to keep things as tightly controlled and as pure and as holy and if you like as religious as possible but then we have this lovely um, argument where we've got Peter um, saying that he'd had an experience of the Holy Spirit the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit so as far as he was concerned the Gentiles were in so that's an argument from experience if you like um, we then have um, an argument from scripture I was just trying to look and see whether we've got an argument from tradition. I suppose the argument from tradition here would be that, uh, that the Pharisees saying there should be circumcision and that people should uh, pertain to the law of Moses or submit to the law of Moses. But I like the idea. Um, so there are the three arguments that Anglicans have, tradition, scripture and reason. So you've got the experience, which we call reason. We've got scripture that James uses. And uh, those of the circumcision faction, I guess, would point to tradition, call that tradition. And as it is in this case, um, reason and scripture um, turn the argument. And James, we're told, says, um, Simeon, Simon Peter, um, has related how God looked very favourably on the Gentiles. Paul also would claim that he'd been called to preach to the Gentiles. And James gives us this scripture and says that he's come to his decision. And so the argument seems to be turning away of not requiring circumcision for Gentile background believers. So shall we turn to the responsory? Back in morning prayer on Thursday. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. I have called you by name, you are mine. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. The Benedictus. You promised, O God, to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. You promised, O oh God, to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us. Let us pray. 
<coughs> unity and diversity, diversity and unity, source, sun and essence. We thank you for this new day. We thank you that in you we have life and hope. We thank you that it, with faith in you, our anxiety and worry is quelled and quenched. Our fear at injustice we may face, or that those in our world may face, our anger on their behalf. Our frustration with sickness, even anger or sadness, whether it is ours or others. We hold before you and pray that you will use us in some small way to make this world, your world, a better place, that you will extend your kingdom in, through and despite us. In the day ahead. With Operation World, we pray for Morocco. We pray there will be peace throughout the nation. That the country's leaders will be enabled to navigate troubled waters of diversity, of Islamic understanding and teaching, with wisdom and good decision making. We pray that alongside that they'll be able to maintain the country <coughs> and uh, all their services, justice, security, economy, healthcare, education, that the people there need. And for the Sahara, where there are only a handful of Christians, but a new day of growth, they write and witness can be seen among the Saharawi peoples. Thank you that the Jesus film is available and that a New Testament is in Hassaniya in the Hassaniya language and it's being prepared. Pray for those who are working amongst these peoples to give them an opportunity to hear, understand, respond to your claims and we pray that you make all others likewise. From Christian Action Research and Education, we pray God will give wisdom to young people and older people to manage the implications of increased dependence on and harnessing of artificial intelligence, robots and other technologies that can transform human life. subject of robots we pray for wisdom strength grace uh, for people in all aspects across the whole spectrum with the changes that artificial intelligence and robots can make and do from artificially synthesizing voice and video to make it look like people are saying things when they're not on the one hand whether that's to blackmail them, or to mislead and misguide, or to discredit, right through to people losing jobs, as they may be manual workers who may have made a living, but now are not able to, even with good terms and conditions, because they've been replaced by automated equipment. <coughs> From Green Christian, a report from the Sustainable Food Trust finds that for every pound we spend on food as consumers, we spend another pound on additional costs incurred by the production and consumption of that food. 
in cash terms in 2015, £43 billion pounds was spent dealt with the environmental impact of food production and £61 billion on food-related health costs, treating conditions such as diabetes, heart disease and the effect of obesity. This is not just because consumers are making poor choices. Changes in the nutrition quality of food are a critical influence. There is little profit in simple, good quality, unprocessed food. Therefore, supermarkets go for increasingly elaborate products disguising cheap ingredients with poor nutritional value with sugar, salt and flavourings to provide the taste promised. <coughs> As one activist put it, we are being poisoned for profit. <coughs> it's one of the things that disheartens me with uh, comments like this is how people have known about these things for decades and yet things seem to be getting worse rather than better. Even with the hope that we have in the youngsters coming forward today, with the, I guess their parents and grandparents would have had hope in them. But things don't seem to be getting better. They may be in certain parts of the world or in certain <coughs> nations. And of course this business of processed food is I guess relatively specific. I guess this deals with the United Kingdom as it's registered in pounds sterling. I pray for a change of attitude to food and health both in consumers, in media, in business. We're in amongst growers. We pray these discussions will move in the right direction, but be held with grace and pinned by evidence. And the conversation will be robust and effective. From our benefice cycle, we pray God's blessings on our welcomers, cleaners, sacristans and flower arrangers, giving thanks for them and the contribution they make to our church life, very often behind the scenes. And we pray that their uh, experience of cleaning and flower arranging, whatever else they have, may be a route into fuller experienced understanding of faith for them, but if it is enough, we pray that you will bless them in return for the contribution they make for maintaining your house of worship as they do. And we thank you for our church membership today, the second half of the broad main contingent, Ben, Carol, Betty, Liz, Doris, Brenda, Paul, Valerie, Des, Julia, Stuart, Vicky. Timothy, Jane, Hugh, Edward, Jill, Sue, Jeremy, Terry, Adelina, Fred, Madeline, Joyce, Margaret, Jan and Chris, Robin, Inga and Sandy. Pray your blessing of health, wealth, prosperity, salvation, healing and deliverance on each of these. Those who are finding things difficult that they will receive care offered and have what they need provided when they call on it. Pray for people whose lives are going well amongst these people. they'll be blessing encouragement to neighbours near and far and when they offer their support and assistance in your name that your kingdom will grow pray for these named that they all with us grow into fuller experience and understanding of faith through prayer study and service we pray that we will be known as believers to be not necessarily those who are circumcised but those who are motivated and inspired by your spirit whose lives are seen to be the more valuable, productive, satisfied, sustainable, whatever it is that appeals to those around us, more powerful, more humble. We pray that these experiences of faith, <coughs> as we read scripture, as we pray, as we look after ourselves and those around us, that you'll be seen in and through us and despite us and that you will draw people through those for whom we have prayed and ourselves. We continue to pray for the establishment of further home groups and more callings to ministry across the benefice. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shams Lukhari Mishmas Yamahata Kasab Sandy Sari Mish Basam has sent you to Kosh Bahad Espali Mishid Yuru Kosh Mahani Hamasa and Chapra Mahas Sam Shas and Yuru Kosh Badi Puramahma Yuhan Asa Kabri Yabishman also for a Sambadi Rikandi Sikiri Yam Chapra Mahas Sam Shas Om Sakari Bash Basamari and Yuru Kosh Basami Shakuri Bash Maha and Brahma's man was a mission Sakati Baham as a Kuru Bash Basamaro Sam Shas and Dirk Kabadu Baham as Rash Bahana. I'm <laughs> O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your servant, from all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs>